Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. My name is Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts, and we're here tonight with Sensei Bill Wolf. And I'm going to jump right in with a question, uh, and then when you hear our, our intro from Sensei Dolfe, you'll understand why I'm asking what I'm asking. Um, Sensei, we love to jump right into a topic, so I got a question for you. What is something that martial artists who are not military men, who are not law enforcement, need to understand about what you'd consider to be the limit of dojo martial arts compared to what you deal with out there? Holy shit, you're opening up to a shit storm here. Let's um, do it. Let's jump yeah, in. <laughs> I think from my experience uh, is the reality gap. There's a big difference between what you do in the dojo and what happens on the street. The, the street, especially now with drugs and the level of violence that is being met, there's no setup. Uh, you know, it, it can explode in a heartbeat. Um, there's no such thing as one punch, one kill. You know, ring deadly is not street lethal. Um, you know, there's too many weapons on the street now, uh, especially edge weapons, and most of those are improvised. You're dealing with uh, high issues of drugs, manic depressants. So you're dealing with someone who can take a lot of pain. You can snap an arm and you keep fighting. Um, you can shoot somebody and they keep coming because the, the level of drugs now. So, uh, you know, we have to start looking at how can we. You know, if if your method of operating is to teach self-defense, and I put that in parenthesis, um, if it's, you know, for lack of a word, say it's just traditional, and that's all you're going to do, you're going to relive the samurai air and all this stuff, and, you know, like the reenactment guys do, you know, you're reenacting martial arts from a, an era that doesn't exist anymore, the moment your student goes on the street, the reality check is, holy shit, so we have to know how to cross-send across that traditional to the reality and uh you know a punch is a punch it kicks it kicks grappling's grappling you know a shooter got he's still a shooter got he. but how do you do that when you're dealing with someone when five cops couldn't hold them down they're bench pressing five cops and you're hitting him with everything you got and they don't feel pain and yet they'll eat your arm so you know we're talking about a level of violence like uh in vancouver for example you go to the bar as a young man and this good looking gal comes up to you and gives you the old wink, wink, you know, and you had a few libations and she says, well, meet me outside. Go, oh, hey, I'm going to get, oh, my night, lucky night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you get jumped by five guys, bam, flat out. So, you know, it, it becomes, you know, like everyone says, all fights end up on the ground, only if you're losing. <laughs> you know, and I, this far you probably can't see very well. I had that, that part of my nose bitten off in a ground fight. So... You know, you put somebody in your guard, you can't control his hands or his mouth. He's, you know, they start biting, they start drawing weapons. So, like Zed guards, you hear uh, used in a lot of styles, are the smartest thing on the street. So, you have to know what is good street and bad street. And a lot of stuff that's taught, whether it be sport or traditional, is good in the school, it's good in the confine where there's rules. But the moment you take the rules out of the equation, watch out. And the person you're dealing with, usually on the street, has no martial arts training. None. They just have, if they've had a lot of street fights, they've got a house skill. And that skill is they will fucking hurt you. Where your student is trained to be honorable, to fight the good fight, for lack of a better description, it doesn't work in the real world. And you're not dealing with one person. The crowd is never neutral. Never neutral. That's why I always go nuts on ground fight. You stay down and your back's exposed, you're getting fucked. You know? Right. So things like this is not, people don't want to hear the message. And that's true, not just in martial arts, it's true in police training, it's, it's true in military training. Like uh, Modern Army Combatics, which is an American Army program, is based on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, up to about, we'll say the Blue Belt level. It's failed in operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, and the Americans have been ordered to make changes. In fact, over 265 changes to Modern Army Combatics, which puts the priority back to stand-up fighting again. But, of course, all the instructors are BJJ-based. They want to keep it on the ground because that's what they know. They don't know how to box. They don't know how to kick. Um, so what you look at the new manual they came out with, you got BJJ. Now you got really bad boxing. They haven't even addressed kicking yet. And you got really bad Filipino knife stuff coming back. So we're back at the 80s all over again because it's failed. And this is what we're facing in a street level as us as instructors 
It's our job to make sure if we have a self-defense shingle hanging on our front door, that we prepare that student for that legitimate execution. In my opinion, everything up to black belt should address that. Once that student has earned black belt and qualified, then we throw back in what we'll call tradition or whatever the heck that, that mantra is. Um, you know, for example, when I was teaching uh, in riot control and policing, uh, we use batons, long baton, short baton. And everybody says, where'd you get, where'd you get this baton training from? It comes from Aido. It comes from uh, different, you know, Joe Jitsu and different forms of stick fighting that are martial arts, traditional. But you have to modify that for a riot situation, close ranks, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a footprint back. But, you know, we have to <coughs> second ceremony. Does the tea ceremony make a better cup of tea than just you going into your kitchen and making a cup of tea? You know, so where's the finite importance that you have to do to prepare your student for the reality of, of what's out there today? And, you know, some of us are getting on. The streets become a lot more violent than it was 10 years ago. I mean, where I live here in Penticton, it's a small town. Violent crimes increased 30% in the last month alone. And most of those are just weapons assaults. So, you know, I love what you said there about the sense. It's long winded, but there no, you it's great. This is exactly what I'm asking. And the thing you said about the crowd is never neutral. I love that. I think that's, I just want to say that out loud because the no, I've never seen a YouTube video where somebody doesn't jump in at some point who didn't care about the fight at the beginning. Now, I want to go back to something you said about there's no one punch, one kill. I get that some people are hopped up or PCPs or there's a way that they're not feeling pain. But why is the one punch, one kill gone? And did it ever work as far as you're concerned? No, it, I don't think it ever did. I, a lot of that's Hollywood hype. We've all hit people really hard, I'm sure, in our training. Uh, you know, when I fought back in the good old days, you know, in the late 60s, 70s, the new kids think we weren't really fighting very hard. But you talk to any old timer that would gotten the ring in the early days of kickboxing, it was hard. So, um, you know, you can punch somebody in the throat extremely hard and some people are going to go down. Others will shake it off. I mean, you know, you know, as you look at a car accident, you know, you someone hits a, a tree at 120 miles an hour and they walk away where someone else dies. Right. The body's incredibly resilient. OK, now, when you look at the concept of striking, uh, when it comes to street violence, for example, there's a lead up phase to street violence where you walk into, say, the restaurant or the bar, or wherever the hell you're hanging out. And the bad guy, for example, he sees you walk in and he's decided you're the victim, maybe because on your forehead at that particular moment, it says weak. So he now is a, a psychological prepared time where he can ramp up. So his endorphins are kicking in. Endorphins do what? What do endorphins do? This is the they in all your senses. Okay, they're a painkiller inhibitor. The other thing is that's the cortisone, right? That's a painkiller. Now you've got what? What's the other big thing that kicks in? Adrenaline. Right. So you are now playing catch up to where this guy's at. So when you hit him, you wonder why it's not effective because you didn't have time to prepare. All of a sudden, this guy's in your face, boom, explodes. Now, if you're well trained, you've got a better chance of doing something. Now, how many of your students, for example, are you training to punch out a throat? How many are you training to take the eye? How many are you training to take the balls right now? Most of you are not because that's not what we'll call it tradition says, you know, and, and stuff. So when you step across that line, so if I hit the guy in the throat, I haven't, my first hit probably is not going to be effective. My third one will, because now I've caught up. My, my adrenaline's cooking. All that stuff is cooking. But you hit the guy hard in the nose, and you wonder why he shakes it off and doesn't bother him, because the painkiller's already there. And he's probably got some experience about getting hit. Mm -hmm. You know, this is where I have a problem where uh, guys teach what we do, and there's no sparring. There's no actual exchange of blows. Somehow we're supposed to cross second phase and magically do something without that pain back and forth, hit, punch, strike, bike, scratch, whatever you want to call it. So on the street, you're having to play catch up like this from where the guys already had time to prepare. So the analogy might be, for example, 
when I, when I fought in good old days, I had time to go in the locker room. I prepared for the fight. I got in the locker room, got all wet, sweated up, practiced all my shit. Then I got in the ring. The other guy was doing the same thing. When I go on the street, that bad guy is already at that position that I'm going, here's my lovely wife. Aren't we having a nice time? And next thing it explodes on me. Yeah. So my mindset's not there. So if we're trained and we're training our people right, we play catch up rather quickly where the victim does not. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So I want to do, I don't know if you've seen any of our shows, but we do a little something called round the horn. So there's a concept you threw out that I want to go round the horn on and we'll end with you, Sensei Wolf. So we'll start with you, Sensei Suino. He talked about honor, how the people in the street are not fighting with honor and how we can fight with too much honor in the dojo. So I want to ask the question of everybody. Do we spar and fight in a way that might actually be too respectful for how everything's going to be when we need to use it? Sensei Suino? That's a pretty big question because you have people of all different walks of life in the dojo and the vast majority of them are there because it's a lifetime hobby, not because they are truly interested in preparing for the violence on the street. Um, so you're not going to train them. Uh, you know, I do, as I've said many times on this show, I believe in pressure testing your martial arts, uh, but you're going to level that up as you're going to deal with the spectrum of violence and your average person in a dojo, or at least in my dojo, um, wants to train, they want to get fit, they want to have fun. Uh, they don't they don't want to have that onslaught. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So uh, it's not for everybody, but I certainly believe it is for a subset of people. Right on. Sensei Dofa, is, is there too much honor sometimes in how in how we spar, how we how we have our conflicts in the dojo for how it's going to be out there? I just don't know about the word honor. Like I mean I'm you can be super aggressive and taking people down and doing all kinds of things and still be an honorable human being. So I think honor is like, I mean, I, I say that I'm not, I'm not trying to kiss up here, but like military people and police officers do some very heinous things, but they're honorable people. They, they do them. So I think the nature of your question is, are we too soft in the dojo? Okay. Right. right? It doesn't have much to do with honor. It has to do with, and I mean, I guess I'm lucky. I had a sensei who <laughs> trained me to be fairly hard when the, the mixing up starts to happen. You know, as Sensei Wolf was saying, you, I don't ever remember a time where like I got punched in the face and a broken nose or, uh, and the fight was done. And Sensei Legacy said, okay, like go fix your face. It was like, no, you better get your ass up and start fighting again. And I mean, I think in our dojos, a lot of people do that, uh, but I don't think, I don't think the, many of the people who come in the dojo, that's not their driving force, as Sensei Srino said. Right. They're actually not thinking about street violence when they come in here. They're not thinking about, they're thinking about something much lesser, preparing themselves for so, something much lesser than what Sensei Wolf is talking about yep. when he's talking about things. That's my opinion, right? right. And as a result, when you, if you want to, certain result you have to train for that result you've heard me say that a million times if you train to win a tournament then you're going to win a tournament if you train to win against somebody who's on methamphetamines and has a bunch of painkillers in their system then maybe you stand a better chance of overcoming that so thanks sensei hanchi legacy what do you think well i believe um uh what Sensi Wall said is true as far as the ordinary person coming in. They don't realize they have never had to face those situations. But um, in our dojo, we have a ground level dojo and the black belts learn how to street, how to street fight. I myself came from the street and I thought it was a bit rough out there in itself. But uh, I refine my skills. And again, there are different ways, like um, Sensi Wool says, um, you have to know how to take the person out or take them down. I mean, uh, I call it turning off the computer. I have been in maybe, I hope no, nobody cares about this, but I've probably been in seven or eight street fights and have always knocked a guy out. I, I have a knockout punch. I just do, and, um, and another way would be to um, 
take away their mobility, break their legs so that they, no matter how hard they wanted to keep coming, they wouldn't be able to keep coming, right? So, but mostly, um, and I've always said this, 85 to 90% of the martial arts club are phonies. They're not real, they're not uh, classical street level martial art that they're supposed to be. They, you know, they'll give a person a yellow belt just so they put stripes on their belts and they do anything else to get that dollar in to keep the, the dojo alive. But they don't fight like, as you two other gentlemen on this note, like what Randy and I did. We fought every day for an hour and a half, maybe sometimes two hours. And it wasn't, it wasn't pull your punch too much. We did pull our punches, but, and there are like maybe 10% of the clubs like that. But again, I agree with uh, what Mr. Wool says. Things are crazy out there now. People are drug crazed, crazy, drunk, and you'll hit some. And if you don't have the power, if you don't use the proper technique to actually turn their computer off, have their brains bash up against their skull and they go out, they're just out. It's not gonna happen for you. So you better train hard. Thanks, Anchi. Sensei Wolf, I'll share with you that one of the confrontations Sensei Legacy had was against four people who came after him and they were drunk and they were in a car and they were high and they came after him in a parking lot and it didn't work out good for them. That's all. I'll, I won't get into too much of the details, but it didn't work out good for them. Allegedly. Allegedly, yeah, allegedly. <laughs> uh, Sensei Wolf, you introduced that idea, but is there anything you want to end on before we go to our intros on that concept? Well, yeah, I agree with all you, what all you gentlemen say. I mean, uh, you know, I have this reputation right now. If I go where I want to go with students, I'll, I'll scare them. They'll jump out the window to get out of the school because it's that scary. So you have to, you know, step it up and you have to train that, not just the physical body, but the mindset, the mind-body connection to up level to that street, if you will. So it's not just that, you know, you, you know, I'll do a, a seminar like a, a three day, four day event where people want to learn military and combat. And they come in thinking it's what they do back home. Well, I teach you, okay, this is military, dude. It's hard. That's not what you can do on a regular basis. You know, you, like you have John and Mary show up, they want to learn a little fitness based self defense, martial. And you have to kind of, um, you know, honor their wishes, but at the same time, you have to slowly build their confidence, step it up, and then you get them to this, we'll call it the, uh, the elite phase, for lack of a better phase, where they can actually go at it. Most people come training, they don't like to spar, you know, so we start with like a pillow fight with using focus pads, and they don't know it's that, and then you, by the time they get to a certain level, <laughs> they enjoy the milling, but it, the average person is not for them. Nobody wants to get knocked and the noggin, you know, stuff like that. And you're not going to come back the next day. So we have to find, again, a common sense approach. And I, I think, you know, from my experience, that's also another problem. You either have the hardcore, you know, as Sandy said, the, the, the 80 percenters that are useless. And then, you know, somewhere in there, you have to know how you're going to get to that point. And, uh, a lot of problems, a lot of instructors, they just don't understand violence. They've never been in, how do you explain a street fight to somebody who's never been in a street fight? How do you explain uh, something that, well, you know, someone's gonna kill you. Like I, I did a seminar not too long, but it's a, a young lad in it. And he says to me, uh, Mr. Wolf, it, 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 you know, his point is, if you had a, you know, a real fight, and I go, yeah, I've had people try to kill me. Does that count? And he goes, <laughs> He says, well, no, not really. He says, well, okay, well, you have to explain to me what you mean by a real fight, son. He says, well, you know, like the UFC, have you ever won the UFC? And I said, yes, I've been in the ultimate fight challenge where my life is on the line. So his friend's doing this to him, shut the F up. You know? <laughs> so again, it's, you know, where's your benchmark? And then, you know, that, and that's where, you know, you, you said, people come in, here's their benchmark, where you're going to take them. So you do like a cardio karate program, that's the, that's the first phase, and that's brilliant because it gets them fit, it gets them thinking, and then you build them up over a period of time. And, and you're not going to get everybody to that elite 
you know, to that that level where they're going to be able, the god of war, for lack of a better description. Uh, <laughs> you know, everybody's a galaxy champion today. Uh, you know, I've lost as many fights as I've won, but I've ne- in, in a tournament, but I've never lost a street fight. You know, I've been stabbed, shot, blown up, and had my nose bitten off, and I'm still here at my old age. My lovely wife, you met earlier, um, she knocked out a, a six foot two, 211 pound British soldier with one left hook after he punched her out twice in a, in a, in a swarming incident. So, yeah, you know, so I mean, you know, it, it, it's how we get there, it's the end results. So how, you know, like, you know, you guys are all samurai, right? And we know the word samurai means to serve. So as a soldier, I serve my country. As a, as a cop, I serve my community. And as a martial arts instructor, I serve my students. So I have to get them to where I think they should be by serving them. And, you, and it, it, you know, it's not just dumping them into the vat of fire. Mm. It's that step-by-step-by-step-by-step by step by step process. Mm-hmm. And at the, end, at the end statement, you've actually got some people that are damn good and they're not cocky assholes. I mean, one of the problems I have with MMA and stuff today, it's all gangster. And I'm, you know, if I, every time I see this, I want to break the fucking fingers. You know, I, you know, I want, where's the respect? We're, we're, you know, like you train police officers to do it. If they fuck up, they go to jail. If a soldier fucks up, they die. So, you know, you know, we have, you know, and for us as, as teachers, as educators, you know, how do we educate them to get there? And we have to be a little smarter. And we have that capability, all of us. And, you know, th- that's all I try to accomplish, it, whether right or wrong, I don't know. Right on. Thanks for that. Thanks for this absolutely incredible dynamic opening to this show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke Chat. Like I said, my name is Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts. I'm privileged every week to host this show with Sensei Randy Dauphin, Sensei Nicholas Suino, and Hanchi Gary Legacy, who are on this call. And, you know, I've in other episodes talked about like 10,000 hours. Like the, I sort of did a bit of math on the training time. Uh, tonight, I looked at the fact that conservatively, I believe the four of us have reasonably traveled over two, th- uh, 2 million miles to train. I did the math on it, thinking about how many times we visit each other, trips to Japan, trips back and down the road to each other, easily 2 million miles just to train. And uh, I just want to throw that out there. We're willing to put the miles in to find each other and those other teachers around the world. And this includes tournaments. This includes all of it. And so it was just fun to think about because, um, you know, the wear and tear on those CV joints and the gas, it's all part of the deal, everybody. Um, Sensei Dope? Two million more to come. That's just the first two million. I mean, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I always get the pleasure to introduce our guest and I've been binge watching his videos all day today, went on his website, which is great. You should go check his website out. Um, but tonight we have master Bill Wolf on, he's an eighth and in Hepkido and also has a lot of experience in judo and jujitsu. Um, since the legacy will, uh, smile at this, he is the founder of modern defendo and that's building on a system that was created by uh, Colonel William Fairburn. And he's added to it just to address the things we were just talking about, the new levels of violence that we're seeing on the streets. Um, He's a former regimental sergeant major. And I like how you described that, Sensei Wolf, where you said the warrant officers and the other sergeants would jump out the window rather than be in a room with you. Um, (laughs) So that's that's the, the level that he was in the military. And that was uh, in the uh, Seaforth Highlanders of Canada, also a former ERT, which is our version of SWAT officer in British Columbia. Uh, For five decades, he's been involved in martial arts. And for 39 years, he has donned a military or police uniform. Um, And I'm quoting from his website, solely interested in the practical side of combat. Uh, Sensei Wolf attributed his high level of expertise to the many years of training and practical experience. And what I like that he talks about is train and then apply, train and then apply. And I think what we're talking about, I think the missing element often is the applying side. Lots of people train. Um, In accordance with his uh, disciplined mind and body, uh, Master Wolf is not easily moved by fads, preferring to keep his repertoire simple and effective. Uh, He goes the extra mile when instructing to make certain that whatever martial art or self-defense he's teaching aligns appropriately with both the military and police training. 
uh, and we were just talking about this as well. Um, he also cares deeply about the people he teaches, desiring to build capability and confidence in his trainees, rather than merely bolstering their ego and getting them into the UFC, I guess. Um, <laughs> for me, uh, what a couple of thoughts I have. Uh, pictures worth a thousand words. Go look at any pictures of Sensei Wolf and you'll come up with a thousand words to realize what a badass he actually is. Um, and that's not only me saying that, but he was described by the U.S. Army Special Forces as one of the most intimidating and knowledgeable instructors they ever worked with. Um, in the military, I mentioned his rank. He was the leader of leaders. Um, and I want to quote something from his website. Uh, violence is now, and it's real, and it has to be dealt with in real terms. I really like that. I've been thinking about that all day. Violence is now, and it's real, and it has to be dealt with in real terms, not fantasy terms and not make-believe terms. Um, he already mentioned also talking about that physical, mental, mind, body connection. Um, I just said to Wolf, love the way that your videos how you portray the training and how you do that. Um, I liked it, just a simple thing when you said, when people come in BJJ people and they put you in guard and you then you punch them in the balls and they're like, well, that's not part of the rules, right? But, um, and then the last thing I wanna go out on uh, before we turn this back over to you is in your video, you said, there are no stupid questions. There are only painful answers. And <laughs> I like the painful answers, uh, sir. So thank you for that. And welcome to the show. Really, really proud to have you on here with us. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I guess uh, it's just another conversation. I think it's an important one. You know, and I, you know, I, I, give, I commend you guys for keeping true to the faith and just teaching and getting as much knowledge and stuff out there as you possibly can because God knows we need it, and especially in this country. You know, it's. It, too many guys are really good at thumb wars and very little at anything else. So, uh, yeah, but you know, martial arts is, you know, it's, I, I've been at it for over 60 years now. So keep plugging away. You know, it's not the age, it's the mileage that starts telling us how far we can go, as you all know. So, you know. Thanks for that. That's it. I'm going to do a quick bit of intro for everybody watching, and then we'll come right back. And I want to hear about that 60 years. So, for everybody watching who's watching later on YouTube, please hit that subscribe, hit that like. We, uh, we really appreciate the shares and the word of mouth. It's happening. It's creating. Everybody's going to our website. You're adding suggested guests. Like We're loving the back and forth flow with y'all. And for everybody listening on the podcast as you're driving or baking or hanging out, that's awesome. But for everybody watching tonight on the Zoom in real time, we got the button at the bottom of the screen, the chat button. You can throw your questions in there and Robert will see those. He just lit up that button. He'll fire them to us, assume they aren't rash yet questions, and we'll ask them of our guests tonight. So we're really excited to see what you come up with and what you'd like to know from Sensei Wolf. Sensei Wolf, I love starting with this question because uh, I want to know how you got into all this. So what was it like growing up for you and what brought you into your first dojo? <laughs> ah, well, my grandfather was a sea captain, an Irish sea captain, and he sailed the Orient. So uh, he used to regale me stories of going into Bangkok and watching fighting in Bangkok, and we're talking like the early 1900s to, to before World War II. Uh, he was in Shanghai. Uh, you mentioned Fairburn. Uh, he told, he gave me stories about Fairburn, and, you know, he gave me a, had a, a, one of a couple of books that Fairburn wrote and stuff like that. So that, you know, got me interested. Was my mom said when I came out of her, I came out marching. So she figured I was going to be a soldier. But uh, uh, back in my mind, soldiers have to know how to fight. Uh, but what really drove me to it, my, my dad had a bit of a drinking problem, Irish, and uh, I figured I'm going to have to beat him up. So I did my research, and, and basically he was a boxer and a very good boxer. And I said, well, it's better than boxing. So the librarian said to me, I, said, I think there's something called judo. And I went, ah, I know judo. <laughs> so I, I was living in a town called Revelstoke, so I started looking for a judo school. And there, there, lo and behold, there was one at the uh, Rocky Mountain Rangers, which is a reserve army regiment. They had uh, armories in Rubblestoke and uh, a Japanese gentleman who worked for the CPR, ran classes basically two nights a week. He was a brown belt. And I joined up. And I was eight years old. And as soon as I 
touched foot on the mat. That was basically it. I knew this was my place. I, I suck at football. I, I hate hockey. I know someone's wearing a hockey shirt there, so I don't want to offend anybody. But, uh, you know, I'm Irish. I mean, we play Hayale, all the, you know, stuff like that. But, so, yeah, but it's just martial arts. And since then, it's been, I've lived and breathed it. I'm just like I'm sure you gentlemen have. And uh, never stopped. And don't plan on stopping anytime soon. So we we have all had that experience. But, but what I'd love to know is what was it about that? You're eight years old. You step in. We all had our version of that. What was what? What was that first little while like that made you go, I'm never not doing this? It's, it's hard. I don't know. I can't really, I don't know how to put it in, in two words. It was just a feeling. It was just, I, it was home. You know, the mats, uh, even getting tossed around, not knowing anything. It was just, wow. And, you know, I, I looked at, I, I had Fairburn's books and they were, by the time I'd finished thumbing through them, there was nothing left of them. I saw a movie with James Cagney called Blood in the Sun, which was made in 1943 at the local theater. And it had him doing judo in it and jujitsu, actually a falling arm bar, which the Gracies claimed they invented. And I went, and that just did it. And then, you know, I had to find it. And then when I found it, it was just, it's just a feeling. It's, I still have that feeling. Every time I step on the mats, it never goes away. It's just, it's, it's like home, you know, does that make sense? It makes absolute sense. <laughs> did you, uh, if I may, and you don't have to go here if you don't want, but did, did you end up uh, seeing if that worked against your father's boxing in any way? Um, interesting point. What I learned from dear old Da, who had very long arms, that unless you know how to box, you ain't going to get inside him to, to uh, take him into a grip and, and do a sort of gallery or whatever. And uh, so I learned to box. Mm. And, uh, but... I, my, my dad and I never really had the comfort, uh, had that final go. But sadly, also, my dad never saw me do martial arts, ever. He never had no interest in it. Uh, you take him to the backyard and show me boxing, usually after a couple of whiskeys and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, back in the good old days, most parents didn't really get involved like they do today and stuff like that. Um, my mom, on the other hand, she was keen as hell on it uh, because she thought it was cool stuff. But, yeah. No, I never, never got to hit him. Maybe when I meet him upstairs, we'll have that final go. All right. Um, tell us about that next period where, you, you know, you start when you're eight. Tell us what other arts you might have encountered and what that, how that led you through your time in school into the military. Um, well, the, one of the guest instructors used to come by at the, the dojo in Revelstoke was Harold Starn. And Harold was a, uh, second Dan in judo. So, you know, imagine we're talking 62. So most people back in 62 didn't know anything about judo. A black belt to them meant nothing. And uh, so when he showed up, he was a black belt. Wow, my eyes were as big as saucers. Uh, the fact he was a second Dan was even more of a deal. Then I found out he'd been in the Royal Marine Commandos and he fought in Burma and SOE and stuff. It was like, whoa. And so when Harold, um, he became, uh, we moved from Revelstoke to Vancouver. He taught at the YMCA and at the Vancouver Judo Club. And um, Harold had started his Judo in England before the war. In fact, uh, if I remember right, his instructor was, uh, um, well, what was his name? Uh, uh, Yoko Tani, who, who was one of the first instructors at the Budokan in London. So uh, Harold, not only did judo, we did fencing, uh, kendo, and Western fencing. He was, he was an expert with Sabre, and he boxed. So Harold was all things, all things martial arts. He encouraged me. We, uh, um, when I got old enough, he got me into the Army cadets. So I got me in, that, that got my Army thing going. Um, when karate first came uh, here, in, I think in Vancouver, around 67, he said, you have to try that. So I went and tried that. When Taekwondo came, he said, you got to try that. So, um, but Harold was, uh, you know, uh, everybody underestimated Harold, but Harold fought against the Japanese in Burma. And uh, by all accounts, badass. Uh, I've seen him, I've seen him fight for real uh, situations. I've seen him, uh, the guys who come into this, the judo club who have been training for five or six years at the, at the Kodokan, and, John, and Harold would, beat them every time. Um, 
there was a, a captain we had in the regiment named Captain Best. He was on the Olympic fencing team, uh, a saber. And Harold hadn't touched a saber since before the war. And they had a fencing match. So at the end of it, I said to Captain Best, I said, how good is he? He said, he's really good. So that was Harold. So, and I guess throughout my short life, I've tried to emulate what Harold taught me and that, that ability just to get in and not, you know, stay focused on one thing, but, you know, here's this and, and not, you know, not do two days here, two days there. You know, I'd get a black belt, get another black belt, train. Uh, like when I took leave, uh, when I was in the Army, I went to Thailand in 1975 to Bangkok. And I got there and not, you know, everything, I'll just go get liquored up. And I said, oh, I saw this thing called Muay Thai. And I went, oh, I'm going to try that. So I found a school, got in there, and these young kids, you know, I was a young kid myself, but they're trying to kick the shit out of me. And I've been doing Hapkido, and Hapkido's got a more kicking than Muay Thai. And uh, so, but I really, real quick, they didn't know how to stop a jab. So I jab them, they couldn't throw anything. And back in those days, you could lock the throw in Muay Thai. And so, you know, I thought, wow, this is cool. So, you know, so everywhere you go, stationed in Europe, there's a martial arts school. You go. Uh, you guys know Alan Sully, I, I take it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I trained with uh, uh, Roland Marchu, who was one of his instructors in France. And I did Sambo in France, which Alan was, was uh, very good at. So, you know, boom, here you go. So I'm not sure you guys don't say me. You talked about two million miles and, you know, and stuff. So, where are there is. You know, I, you know, I trained with uh, former North Korean army defectors who were teaching North Korean military stuff who taught the Russians, you know, Sistema, which is now 2000 year old Russian system. These guys taught that 2000 year old Russian system to the Russians. So, uh, you know, hard men, brilliant men. You know, Jay Song who taught me how Kato originally was the first guy to bring up Kato to Canada. He was a Korean Ranger, uh, fought in the Korean War, tough guy, you know. So, Everything, mostly old guys, and I'm sure you've been around. The old, old guys were guys that actually had used it. And I think that's kind of what stamped me to what I do now because it was, you know, yes, you had, you know, you go to a Shiro or a Juro tournament and, and you had to play by rules. Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of 50 50. You win, you win, you lose, you lose. But as soon as I started giving up, I never lost. So you can't do that when there's rules. So, but you go and try and have fun with it. You know, and to me, it's like fun. You always, Wherever it is, whether it be kendo, aido, you know, I'm not good at it, but I go and have fun with it. Like, you get my kendo, I put my kendo stuff on, I get a guy who's really good, he tries to whack the shit out of me. You know, I want to kick his knees out and cheat a little bit so I can get at least one win in, but, you know, stuff like that. So, uh, you know, and I'm sure you guys are the same. Though, but for me, it's like the 60s was, uh, it was just, it was like a melting pot. Things were just starting to come into Canada as martial arts, like there was always judo and a little bit of jiu-jitsu. Karate was new, uh, taekwondo was new. By the end of the 60s, the 70s, ju judo had fallen out of favor. Jiu-jitsu was non-existent in, uh, in Western Canada. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, it, it was like this, uh, stuff like that. And, you know, and, and as you were, um, as you were moving through, you know, it sounds like the military combined with the martial arts was always a thing for you, given that first instructor of yours. But did you find that martial arts background helped you as a military man? Did the martial part of it, was that ingrained in a way where you looked around at some of the other guys were like, I feel like I have an edge here or or, or does it not totally apply? Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, you go because you have a little more sort of confidence in yourself. Uh, you're fit. Um, yeah. I had, uh, I, 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 for example, when I went to, I, one of the reasons I got in the military as a young lad is I was always getting in trouble because I was always fighting. Long story short, the judge said, uh, it's either the circus or the military. And I said, well, I'll take the military because I had a cadet background, whatever. So, you know, and uh, my first instructor in the military, um, Patty Taggart, and Patty was a little short Irishman, literally from Ireland. He came to Canada before the war working the coal mines when the war came, he thought, oh, I'm going to go join the army and go fight because it's safe to work in the coal mines. But he was a boxer and an unbelievable boxer. He was an Italian boxer. And about this third day in recruit school, I pissed him off for whatever reason. I, I guess it was because of my attitude. I thought, well, whatever. And he, I remember the left hook and that's all I remember. So then I found out later, Patty fought with the first special service force. He was first Canadian parachute regiment. He fought in 
most of the major battles in World War II, Korea. And as uh, he used to tell us, I killed more men than Satan. And that was the truth. So, but Patty taught boxing. He was originally a boxing coach. So you learn from Patty. And, uh, you know, we had the boxing uh, judo team in the military, on base judo team, battalion judo team. Unlike the Americans and the British, the Canadian Army didn't support us in judo teams. Like I came off exercise in Germany and I was going to a military judo competition with no time to train. You know? mm. And of course, I got there uh, to the competition and the Russians were there. That's all they do. The Americans were there. That's all they do. The Dutch were there. That's all they do. The French, that's all they do. And I got up there and I had a Dutch guy and he was quite good, actually. I think he became part of the Dutch uh, Olympic team. And he went in my shoulder. I could just, but I still hear the tear today. And I go, you know, so, but the military, you know, it's like boxing. And eventually by the early seventies, they said, you can't do judo anymore. You can't do boxing because too many people are getting hurt. Then eventually they started shit canning on in combat because we were hurting too many civilians. You were the poor, get liquored up. So, you know, but as you said, when I came in, that gave me the impetus, you know, because you, know, you can go to the mess and get drunk, or you can go to the local judo club, or you go to the local martial arts club. So I would go to the local judo club, the local martial arts club. Then I'd go to the mess and get liquored up because I had to recover from all the owies and stuff <laughs> like that. You know? So, but you know, like in Europe, you had a whole bunch of different people to train with when I was stationed in Germany and stuff. Yeah. Like uh, and you know, you, you go, you know, you guys know, you go explore, you, you, you hear something. Ah, like I was in, in leave in Cairo in Egypt because we were stationed there. And I heard the ki, and I'm walking in the middle part of Cairo, and so I'm following my ear. And sure, should I get there? And there's a karate club in Egypt, in Cairo. So that night, instead of going to get liquored up, I'm just standing there. I'm, in, you know, they loan me a, a gi, and I'm doing karate in Egypt. So, you know, and we're, we're talking 1974. So, you know, stuff like that. So that's what you do. At least yeah. that's what I hope everybody does, you know, and just go and have fun. And you may look like an idiot doing it, but what the hell? So let me throw out a question for you, because um, for people listening who aren't going to serve in the military or, or you know, you know, when you're talking about a lot of these guys who you really go like, holy crap, they served in this conflict. My dad did this over in Bangkok, this. Some people aren't going to get to do that. What would you say, okay, you don't get to do that, but make sure your training includes this because all these people who did that have this because you seem to have a real respect and reverence for those guys. And I love that. And, and I love you crack that open for people who won't do that. Well, you also have, you know, it's a different military today. You're saying like, you know, we have a lot of Afghan vets, but a lot of the Afghan vets have left the army because it's peacetime. In a peacetime, you go back to polishing boots, you go back to garrison routine, it's boring. When you're ramping up for war, it's war. Now we got the conflict in Ukraine. And like one of the reasons unarmed combat in the military got basically shit canned is because they used to say, oh, Mr. Wolf, now everybody drives tanks. Everybody's got an armed personal care. We don't need this anymore. We have nuclear bombs, right? So during the Afghan conflict, Armed combat became unpopular again because you're fighting in a small house. We call it fish, fighting in a small house. So you do a room entry. Well, now you're in the hand to hand. And the Afghans, and they would tell you, are pretty good wrestlers. We learned from Alexander. So, and they also, the Taliban, they spent a lot of time in hand to hand. And they all, and hand to hand with them is a lot of knife work. So all of a sudden, you know, they decided we have to start doing it. So they reintroduced, uh, more of a mixed martial arts program in, back into the training during that phase. Um, I mean, I, they'd call me up and say, what do you think? And a lot of it was patterned after the American program, which is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I said, shit can that nonsense right off the bat, because uh, there's nothing worse than ground fighting with a guy with a knife in his hand. And, you know, it's not a safe place to be. So, you know, but if you want to be, like I tell young kids and a lot of young guys come training, they want to be soldiers, they want to be police officers. So they're coming to me because part of the rule is go in knowing how to do this stuff. Because like when I taught at the police academy as a police officer, maybe three or four guys had any martial arts training. And most of that as was as a child, because I don't know, it's like we are on the West Coast, as I was telling Robert, most people see martial arts as for kids, not for adults. 
So most cops don't have any experience. So when I'm teaching them how to do, you know, what you would take for granted is the black belt, they don't have it. So every time, like all guys come train with me now, we say they're a black belt and they don't know how to, they don't know how to do a basic punch, they don't know how to do a basic kick. And if I say, okay, show me, I'll show the guy, the guy says judo, jiu-jitsu, they don't know it. If I say, uh, show me the guy, shh. Most of them don't know what it is because most jujitsu today is, oh, what's called the guy? So it's a wrist, maybe it's a wrist turn or an arm bar. The, the, the Japanese names aren't used anymore. So they just don't have the basic skill sets. So what we try to do is, okay, you come train me. I'm going to give you the basic skill sets to go into police with what we call use of force today. You know, back in the day, we call it self defense, so that you can deal with that violent criminal. You're going to have to, first, you're going to have to build a fight. And you're gonna to have to build a rest and control. And most kids, you know, when I say kids, I'm talking, you know, 25 eight years brackets, they've graduated university and they majored in beer drinking and chasing the opposite sex, not in how to fight. So you got some young lads in your dojo or young ladies in your dojo, you want to train them up to, you know, that level of experience. What I loved about the French police, I don't know, and I don't know if it's true anymore, in order to become a cop in France, you had to have a black belt in the martial art. Doesn't matter what martial you had to have a black belt. I don't know if that's true or not anymore. But in Europe and France, six percent of the French population do martial arts, and eighty percent of that's adult based, not child based. Mm -hmm. In Canada, it's like 034 percent. It's very very low. You think United that States, difference is why, why do you think that is? What, what do you attribute that to? Better marketing, I guess. They, um, I, I, I blame Hollywood. You know, you watch a Hollywood movie. It, it, it's silly. Uh, a lot of the attitudes we have here, I think, uh, since Lacey, we shown us the, the Mick Dojo makes up this nonsense. People go on and look at it and go, this is really stupid. And it doesn't, you know, it, it's not affecting their sense of accomplishment, really. So we're not stepping up the time. Like yoga does a much better job marketing than we do. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you know, they have 15% of the market share. Ah. So that's a lot better. So the United States, about 1% of Americans do martial arts. Right. That's not a, that's, that's not success, by the, by the way. Uh, but then in Japan too, it's not much higher. And in, 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 in China, it's 2%. So reason, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, um, I, I want you to finish that sentence, but then I do want to go around the horn a little on this before I come back to a question for you, but, but please finish your thought there. Just, well, you know, so again, you know, like for us, you know, like to be a, you know, in my mindset, to be a soldier, you had to know how to fight. And empty-handed is buku important. Uh, when I taught under combat in the army, uh, for example, I taught a program a bunch of years ago for the United States Marine Corps. And they, out of the American military system, the army or uh, Marines, the Marines have a better program. They call it MCMAC. And a little more complicated than I would like to see it, but it, every Marine gets has to do it. The average American army soldier gets 1.5 hours of modern army combatics a month, maybe. And that all depends if the commanding officer likes it, understand? So for us, in my mindset, if I get a young soldier, a young police officer, my job is to teach them a certain combat. So when I was teaching the Marines, I said to the Marines, why does your commandant want you to learn unarmed combat? So the Marine answer is, oh, kill, rah, rah. And they'll do that grunting you all hear in the movies, right? Rah, rah. And I go, wrong. The combat in the United States Marine Corps wants you to do under combat so you gain the assertive confidence so you will close with the enemy and kill him. Because the guy said to a colonel, says, you know, he's been in the army 20 odd years and he thought under, under combat was a waste of time. He's sitting back in a chair, sort of like I'm now going, I said, what would you do if somebody attacked you? And I said, I'd shoot him. So I had my folder in my pocket, I took it out of my pocket, real fast, stuck it to his neck. He fell out of the chair on the ground and says, what are you going to do now? You going to shoot me? You don't have a gun. Says, you've been in the army 20 years, you don't know what to do. You got soldiers out there, been in the army for two years, 18 years old, what are they gonna do? Right. So he was on the, we started 0900 next day, he was one of the first in line. <laughs> Good right. for him. And the reason, the reason he had no respect for it, because the training was so stupid that he'd been put through, right, as part of the military package or wherever it came from, that he had no confidence in it. And that's 
where us as legitimate instructors have to build back that confidence. And that comes back to why the percentage is so low in what we do, because people don't perceive it as being successful. Like the average person doesn't think Brazilian jiu-jitsu is going to work on the street. You lay on the ground, for God's sakes. I'm just going to boot fuck you. You follow what I'm saying? So where do we step up from there? So that's our job. In the military, your job, if you've got a kid come say, I'm going to join the military. And you have to prepare them. And close combat is a given. It's mm -hmm. happening right now in Ukraine. The tanks are there. The missiles are there. All the drones are there. But when they're too close, it's a mix-up. And the kid who knows how to fight, and in my day, I taught him how to take that knife. Like I trained with a, a Chinese major, Communist Chinese Army. He says, well, you spend, where's all your Kung Fu? He says, we don't do Kung Fu. We do knife food. He says, what do you do knife food? He says, we learn in Korea, you can't kill a six foot seven Texan doing Kung Fu. So we take our knife out and kill him. So their martial arts, military martial arts, has evolved. Mm. And we're not. We're still, like, I'm an empire builder. I, I, I do Defender, which is the Canadian Army system. When that's what I teach in the military. That's an empire. And I protect my empire. You know, like I joke with Brazilian kids who do the modern army combatics. They protect their empire. And if you do, you know, street style karate, you protect your empire. And you don't let anybody in to show the difference of how that empire may be a little weak and how to strengthen that empire and how to build it. Now, what the Chinese and the Koreans have done, they've, the Korean Special Forces do not learn Hapkido. They created their own close combat system that could have, that they've learned over the years is going to be effective in modern combat. Same as the Chinese. They, they don't do Kung Fu. They have a specific program they teach within the Chinese Army, which is specific to combat today. So in police training, for example, we failed the constable's patrol level. Like the, R, the RCMP ministerial inquiry uh, a little while ago said that all training in the RCMP in the last 20 years has failed the constable's patrol level. That includes use of force training, weapons training, tactical training. It's failed the officer. That's a huge indictment. But no one wants to spend the money to correct it because training costs money. Mm -hmm. military so if you can train a young lad or young lassie up to go in the military who's got some skill sets, they may never get any more skill sets once they get in the military. But what you've taught them is always going to be here. That's locked on. And when that shit happens, they can unlock what you taught them, and that will save their life. That's your job. Does that make sense? Makes absolute sense. So I'm going to go around the horn back on a question that came up for me earlier, and then we're going to go to uh, another idea with you. So let's start with you, Sensei Suino. We all know that martial arts is a winning lottery ticket, and we all know that most people don't cash it. You know, if his stats are correct, and we'll assume they are, 99% of Americans aren't doing this, and 99.7% of Canadians aren't. How and why? You know, how do we get more people in and why aren't they today? <laughs> Man, I wish I could answer that question. I'm doing my part. You know, I'm trying to get to 200 people in my dojo um, uh, mm -hmm. teaching. I don't know now what 25 seminars, uh, 25 seminars a year. Um, uh, spending money on ads online, uh, trying to be a, um, uh, uh, a Johnny Appleseed of martial arts. I'm trying to go across the world and help convince people of the importance i think it's the best i've said this so many times i think martial arts is one of the best activities human beings do because of the chain the arc right the lifetime arc of a martial artist takes us towards yeah. higher calling helping others um i don't know i'm working on that answer sean come back to me in about 30 <laughs> years and i'll have it figured out <laughs> right on punchy legacy why aren't more people doing this and cashing their ticket and well, more people are doing it but the problem is um they're pushed in by their parents who don't want to do it. Or when they come in, they don't realize what martial arts is. They think it's a sport. They're going to come in and play a game. When it gets rough, they quit. So uh, I agree with the percentage of persons. They're probably 0. 0.00001 who take martial arts very seriously and realize it's a killing art. And when you say killing art, to parents or children or people who come in, they get a little bump in the nose, they quit. They have a hard time holding people in. They don't realize, it's the, the Western world, I think, mainly, don't realize how deadly martial arts are if you do it the right way. And, you know, I just want to say this, uh, 
I write a lot of stuff, and this is a just an introductory line that I was writing two days ago. And I say, the body must train hard, excuse me, the body must train hard enough to allow the mind to trust it. You have to, uh, in order to accustom yourself to be brave enough to commit to the task at hand. In other words, facing what this gentleman has faced. And I say, imagine what a police officer must face daily. You have to be able to stand there and face somebody and say a 15 year old person is, has a gun and he's gonna shoot a woman and, and her baby. A police officer has to be, have been trust uh, trained hard enough to just shoot that young teenager. And that's a hell of a hard thing to overcome. And that takes a lot of mental training. Your, your body cannot do the task at hand unless it's trained so hard and so that you as a person inside trust your body to be able to do that job, right? In order, and the only way you can handle that drug craze SOB out there is by calming your mind and letting everything else react to and reacting to everything that's going on at that time. And it takes, and I like a lot of persons out there to take uh, note of this. It takes 35 years to become a karate master. Everyone between 30 years is a failure. Everyone after that is just on their way. So it takes a lot of training and people are not willing to put that much into it. That's what's going on nowadays. They think they're gonna take karate for three months or any martial art for three months and they're gonna be able to do what they see Bruce Lee doing on television. They have a completely wrong, con the wrong concept of what martial arts is. But a police officer like this gentleman here who has to face every day in the street putting their life on the line. They're not gonna to wanna to learn bullshit. They're not gonna want bullshit. They're gonna they're gonna treat it seriously because their life depends on it. Thanks, Hachi. Sensei Dofa, why aren't more people cashing in that ticket in their pocket? I agree with all the stuff Sensei like C just said. <clears throat> Probably won't surprise people that I do. I think people come in with a preconceived notion and they're mostly recreational martial artists and there's probably things that are funner recreational activities to do than come into a dojo like this where you're going to get punched in the face and you're going to get swept onto the ground and you're going to get twisted and bent and you're going to so I think it's uncomfortable to do real martial arts and most people don't want to be uncomfortable they just don't want to be they want to be comfortable mm -hmm. um you know, I see it in here, like just tonight I was teaching fighting and people get popped in the head. These are yellow belts, people who just got graded. And so now as Sensei Wolf was saying, you know, okay, what got you to your yellow belt is not what's going to get you to your green belt. we got to amp this up a little bit, right? So now they're getting, I'm making them fight brown belts who are like being compassionate, but smacking them around a little bit and they're getting shocked by it a little bit. Like, and my quote is, well, if you come in here and you don't expect to get roughed up a little bit, you've got the wrong notion of what this is about, right? You should be expecting to get roughed up a bit. And I don't know, personally, I like it. I like getting roughed up a bit. <laughs> That's, most people don't. They want it to be safe and it's not going to be always safe. Thanks, Sensei. Sensei Wolf, it is time for your 10 questions. No. Uh -oh. All our guests, the same questions. We ask that you answer impulsively, but then if you do need to expand on it, feel free. What is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Running away. <laughs> Who is the most influential martial artist in your life? Errol Stern. Uh, who do you think is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? It's 
Hard question. Uh, successful pushing things the way I like to see it go. And I say Mori Yeshiva. I think the fact that he was able to take martial arts and say, let's talk about making it peaceful, making people a better person without violence. That's utopia. I don't know mm -hmm. if I can ever do it, but I it's a nice thought. Let's put it that way. Um, what excites you most about the next five years of your training? Getting out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know how old you are, but it, you know, once you get past that certain stage, and when I hit 65, you know, they say, say when you hit 50, everything you did before 50 is going to come back to haunt you. Well, that was 65 for me, and that was a few years ago. So the arthritis and the knees, the back, you know, so you get out of bed and you, you go, you work it. Luckily, I got a wife who says to me, I don't want a fat old senior sitting on the couch. So that keeps me motivated. <laughs> to stuff like that. Um, right. I don't know. But it's just, it's like I said, training. I mean, I still try. Um, I still try to show my kids jumping spinning kicks. I'll dump it with Shigi. What you've ever seen me do is pretty laughable. 40 years ago, it wasn't, but today it is. So, I mean, you know, we all do, you know, we, you know, it's like I just have my bokeh in the corner and I take the kids and show them how to use that. And the neighbors look at me and what the hell are you doing that for? So it's just, it, it's, I don't know, five years, love, keep up. It's still love. It's like my wife, I love her. We keep her going, you know, keep her going. Love. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? I'm going to introduce you to the first guy who created this shit so we can get rid of all the bullshit. <laughs> first <laughs> love it um do you have a favorite film and television martial artist even if they're not necessarily a real life martial artist Tele well, first i'd have to watch television mm. um, how do you guys have time to watch television <laughs> um i'd i'd, I'd say chuck norris because I, I i've met chuck norris a couple times and he's a super nice guy and i, I think what he does he tries to represent uh all of us uh uh flag well how's that sound yeah um do you have a martial artist living dead in all of recorded history you'd want to train with the most um if i could kimura again there's two seminars with kimura with doug rogers judo you know kimura is yeah okay um and he said to me young man more technique and I'm still striving for that. So if I could, and of course, back then, I didn't know who Kimura was. I just knew he was super important. Now I know who Kimura is. So I would, it's like all these really brilliant old men I met. If I had, if we had cell phone cameras back in the day and they would allow me to take pictures, you know, but no, I, I, it's all up here. But no, Kimura would be the man. That's awesome. That's some legend shit right there. Um, if everyone in the world could get the greatest benefit you've gotten from martial arts, whether they train or not, what benefit would they get? Assertive confidence. Hmm. Not just confidence. Assertive confidence. Assertive confidence comes back to the as senses were saying about going into harm's way, staying rational in the heat of battle when everybody else is being emotional. It's about knowing what you can do when you do it. It's like I had my gun, I've been squeezing to kill that guy, and I've had to let go of the pressure because. The circumstances weren't correct. It's having the discipline to do it. That's what martial arts, that's what pseudo confidence is about. Last two questions come as a pair. Your greatest achievement and your greatest regret. My wife and kids. And Not having that fight with my dad, I guess. <laughs> not, out of, not out of meanness, just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, Sensei Dofa, you got, some, you got a question for us? I do have a question. Uh, Sensei Wolf, on one of the videos I watched, I, I really like that you just call bullshit on things. Like, and So one of the things you call bullshit on, uh, and I can't remember which video it was, I apologize. But you call bullshit on the fact that under pressure, you can't use fine motor skills. And the example that you gave is that 
you know, changing a clip, a magazine is a fine motor skill. And I can't think of a more pressure filled situation than somebody firing hot lead at you and you running out of bullets and having to change the clip. Why do you think people say you can't use fine motor skills in a, in a conflict? And what do you train? How, how do you train people to be able to do something like that? Well, does the word laziness come to mind? If you do it five times, it's the enemy. It's a thousand times, it's yours. So if you're going to do it, whether it's changing a magazine on a weapon, a thousand times, you get it pretty quick. If you're going to learn to do a uh, guys, this turn, whatever, five times, it's the enemy. A thousand times, it's yours. So you probably like, oh, Shotagari. Five times, it's the enemy. A thousand times, it's yours. Fitness. All these things, you know, there's too much, uh, you know, we're paraphrasing, there's too much bullshit. Guys aren't putting the time into learning stuff, so they make an excuse. Like you, when your lads were talking about the, the guard and the graces and stuff. Yeah, uh, you, you know, just punch his balls out. It, it's a great piece of kit in a sports competition, but it's dumb. So it's lazy in a lot of, a lot of stuff. So um, training, you know, there has to be a range. Uh, like what I've always done is I train striking to get really good at that because you can basically teach a dog to kick and punch in, in short time. When you get into grappling, it's more time consuming, like to be able to do a proper uh, shoulder throw or wrist lock or whatever. It, it takes a lot more effort to learn to do it. Over a period of time, you learn to do your punching quicker than you learn to do a proper wrist turn. Then, of course, you learn the wrist turn, then you have to learn the variables of wrist turn because some people are strong, other people are on drugs. How do you make it work? So it's again, discipline. You can't do what we do without discipline. And that comes back to what people are afraid of today, discipline, repetitiveness. Uh, if, if there's not self-gratification in two strokes of the pen, you're not gonna do it. And it comes back to what was said, you know, it was high-fiving in the dojo. Oh, that was so brilliant, high-five. I mean, I, I, I watch uh, a lot of guys training. There's two guys training and five guys watching. What the hell? So yeah, just train. A thousand times it's yours. Fine motor skills, it's a cop out. Like finger locks, can't do them. It's a cop out. I've broken guy, shattered guys' arms with a finger lock. You know, and I can do them in a heartbeat. Trust me. Okay. I, you know, so stuff like that. So again, it's just a crock of shite, as our Irish cousins say. Um, question for you, because you're one of the, the, the few people we've had who, who focuses on Hapkido. Talk to us about how you found Hapkido. How you got into it and how you decided to to get brilliant at it as opposed to just taste it um uh jay han song uh brought it to edmonton in about 68 when i got uh, stationed to edmonton um i was looking for martial arts and i stumbled across him um and he was uh he was a fifth down in hapkido way back in the 60s brilliant technician um, but he could kick like a, his kicks were flat. You, you couldn't see them; they're hard. Was like whatever. But his, the techniques and the hub keto back then was very hard, very hard, hard training, hard, hard martial art. Um, if you know anything about hub keto, it was an extension of daito aiki jiu jitsu. So it had all the parts. It had it had the the aiki, it had the kicking, punching, joint locks, etc. It had weapons, sword. Long pole, short pole, uh, sticks, uh, canes, you name it. It, had, it was a deal. So it was a very interesting martial art. Uh, I thought quite complete from what I'd been experiencing thus at that time in my life. Um, there was problems with some of the punching was really stupid, um, you know. But you know, I, I augmented that with boxing. So, but the kicking, um, like I told you, when I fought in Thailand, I was doing kicks they'd never seen before, and they were hard. Um, so, you know, back then, Jay Song was a, a, a great master. Uh, I trained with Jihan Jay, who was one of the head guys. Uh, Kwon Sik Myung, that's my son, that's my youngest one, Quaid, um, until he's Irish. Um, the uh, Jihan Jay, Kwon Sik Myung, uh, a little bit with Bong Su Hong, who did Billy Jack. Have you ever seen the movies, Billy Jack, Bong Su Hong? Um, all good men, but they, they all have different slant on it. 
Uh, when I trained in Korea, I did pilgrimages to Korea. The army I was lucky that uh, the army sent me to Korea to do stuff because I was into Korean martial arts. The, back then, the old Italian commanders were a little more squared away. Um, so I got to train with some really uh, Lee Mung Suk, who was uh, Young So Choi, who was the founder of Kido's number four student. Brilliant. I mean, I kind of doubted a little bit because I, I was training in, in Seoul and uh, with a guy and he would come and watch and I didn't know who the gentleman was because he was old and it would stop, everything would stop and everybody bowed him. Because oh, that's my title, not Quan Jin. And so they, he come three or four days and he's watching me, watching, watching. And anyway, so he calls me over to, his English is quite good. And he was a mathematics professor at the university in, in, in Seoul. So he says, go get me your wallet. What? Go get me a wallet. So I go to the change room, I get my wallet, he opens it up. He goes, oh, not enough one. He hands it back to me, he says, gives me a card, says, be here tomorrow at 6, 8, 6 p.m. or 6 a.m. So I go to, it's his school, and I go there, and he started training, basically from scratch. And he, and he said, you don't. Because the guy I was training before him was a bit of a goof. Uh, so I said, you, so you punch me, you kick me. So I, so, so I, you know, I did it slow. He said, no, no, do it hard. So I got in my box and, and he, he avoided it. He sent me sailing. He was like, like, now this guy, he fought with, the, he was uh, indoctrinated into the Japanese army in World War II, so he fought with the Japanese. Uh, he fought in the Korean War. And, but he was a technician. He was brilliant. Mm -hmm. He was much like a, a very finite form of a Kimura, if you will. And um, I used to go back to Korea all the time to train with him. And you know, he was like a surrogate, but he was brilliant guys. So although there's some in the old Hapkido, there was really hard guys, really good training. Hapkido today's like if I do Hapkido seminar, they don't like it. Because mm -hmm. old Hapkido, the new Hapkido, they're doing back handstands and flips and shit. And I'm going, that's great athletics, but it's not Hapkido. Mm -hmm. And you know, show me the show me the entry, show me how you get into the clinch, show me how to to transfer to this, how to do this, how to do that, how to do a little spinning kick, Hadondoro Chigi. You can't do it. I said, what's Hadondoro Chigi? So I'll show him. And I'm an old man. I can still do Hadondoro Chigi. So stuff like that. So things migrate. And I'm sure within the price here that you guys work in or you're training, you see that happening as well. You know, there's, here's this, and it deviates this way, deviates this way. Uh, what happened after Young So Choi died, the founder, everybody came out of the work saying they started it. They claimed it. Jian Jay and all these guys. And, uh, stuff like that so yeah uh, but in its original state really good martial art really hard um I, it stood me in good stead uh, when i did uh, like with unarmed combat there's a lot of similarities wrist turns a wrist turn arm bars and arm bar there's a lot of similarities and the combat mindset are the old instructors because they actually fought in wars was the same the new generation um, started to mimic what was coming out of Japan, you know, like Aikido and stuff. They started creating, like in Aikido, there was no, uh, like you had a first dance, second and third dance, but there was no, you know, you didn't have a um, different, you know, Kyoshi and all, you know, these Hansei and all, those didn't exist. You were either Subonim, Subonim now, which was a senior instructor, or Kwanjinim, and Kwanjinim came as fifth and above, which just means principal of the school and stuff like that. Now, it's like uh, uh, Kendo, is Yudo, or, or sorry, Kendo is Gumdo. And it's it's Kendo. They just call it. And but in the Koreans will tell you they invented it. No, it's Japanese Kendo, dum dum. It's like uh, judo is called Yudo. And I was I had the honor to get to train at the Korean uh, uh, judo college in Seoul, uh, uh, which they call Yudo. And the Koreans did quite brilliantly in the Olympics. So and I got to work with a silver medalist and Granted, my feet never touched the mat, but it was fun in, in regardless. But uh, stuff like that. So, uh, you know, a, a style like Hapkido gives you a very good grounding, not just in one thing, not just punching, kicking, joint locking, throwing. So, if you could take five martial arts and put it into one martial art, that would be Hapkido. Right on. And um, stuff like that. But Hapkido only started in 1947. It's not a, now they tell you it goes back to the Shilai dynasty, 2000 years. That's all a bunch of bullshit. Right. <laughs> Um, Sensei Suino, I know uh, you have a question for us that came in from one of our uh, watchers. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Sensei Wolf, uh, one of my uh, longtime judo and jujitsu students 
uh, originally got his black belt with his son, uh, his sons in Hapkido. And he was going to ask some questions about Hapkido as a martial art, which you've preemptively answered. Um, but he was also wondering if you ever knew uh, Grandmaster J.H. Choi, who was founder of the Chung Mu style of Hapkido? Janet of New York? Uh, don't know. Could be. Like Choi's like Smith in, in Korea. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chung, Mu, Chung Mu style, apparently. Choi, uh, he's a Choi. Uh, Choi Mu. Uh, I didn't, he was on New York, New Jersey. It could be the same guy. It sounds familiar, but yeah. He was selected by Young Su Choi to be his successor. And it's the same guy. Uh, he passed away. And, uh, but then Hapkido uh, factionalized. When I started Hapkido, there was one group, Korean Hapkido Association. Now there's like 27 different organizations and everybody's the, the grand poobah of this and that. So, but there's a lot. Um, you, know, you have to ask him how old the guy is. It's, I'm I'm considered second generation Hapkido. Yeah, he, he seems to suggest, and we're kind of doing this through a chat on the side here, um, he seems to suggest that you may be a contemporary of him. So you may be about the same age as this guy. Yeah, maybe. It's hard to say, but yeah, there's, yeah, like Choi, uh, and it's all very common. And a lot of Koreans have the same uh, uh, middle and, and the same last names, depending on the family clan. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, never know. Um. What do you want to tell us about the wolf combatives? It's real sexy. Yeah. And, well, as I was trying to explain to Robert, my forte these days is, you know, being Irish Canadian, Canadian Irish, whatever you want to call it, is when I retired, I opened a hockey school just to keep myself busy. And uh, what happened in the short deal is, police and guys would want to come train with me because I, I retired the academy and so we had a course and, and basically we created a, a defender police training program at the academy so that's what I continued in Akira school so I had Akira class and then everybody started watching the defender class and oh this is much simpler didn't have to do all these fancy kicks and stuff so eventually that took over what we were doing it was more interest so I kind of said okay let's gravitate there and then, um, like I told you, I did Devil's Brigade, which is a documentary on the First Special Service Force. And then what I quickly realized with the military and everybody, they were kind of shelving all this brilliant training to the museum. It was being put up there and everybody was saying, forgetting about this program, the Canadian Army, like the Canadian SAS company in 1947 created this brilliant unarmed combat session or training under Pat O'Neill, who taught the First Special Service Force. And O'Neill, during the war was the highest ranking martial art. He was a, a fifth dan in judo in, in before the war, uh, uh, awarded in the, by the Kodokan. Um, and he trained with Kimura. When Kimura was a young kid, 15, 16, O'Neill was one of the guys in, O'Neill was brilliant, was it? Uh, anyway, uh, so I had the benefit of doing the instructor's course in this program way back in the day in the army because I was a martial arts guy, I had a black belt. And I went and did the 11 week instructor's course. Brilliant. Uh, you know, it's one of those things, and I, you know, I've used it as a soldier, as a cop, saved my life, more so than Hapkido. Okay. Because the, the training mindset comes back to the sense of that rational mind versus emotional mind. But we let it die. Nobody wanted to maintain it. The military just kind of said, well, we'll do, they still do elements of it, but not the whole program. And the whole program is what gives that soldier that a certain confidence. And that's what I wanted. To not let go of. I didn't want it to disappear into history. You know, it, it doesn't even write a paragraph in our military manuals. So, I, when I did the police uh, program from that pro, military program, we had a two year study, a uh, POPAT study, uh, police officers' physical ability study done by Doug Charnolds, who was a retired RCMP staff sergeant. We looked at every assault on the police officer in Canada for two years, hmm. how it took place. Uh, you know, set up the lead up phase, the holding mechanism, the aftermath, skill sets of the officer and the perpetrator, et cetera, et cetera. And we, that gave us our evaluation objectives and we had to plug in performance objectives to create a training system that was court defensive. That became a police model off the military defender program, which became modern defender. So we started teaching that. And uh, long, so Wolf's Combatives is my training company. That's what 
um, when I go teach police and military, I do it through Wolfskin Battles, which is a trained in company, not a martial arts school. Uh, the system, if I teach hand to hand combat, is called modern defendo or defendo, depending on whatever. But it, it comes back to that 1947 program that was created by Pat O'Neill, uh, uh, Colonel Guy Artois. Uh, Colonel Guy Artois is a legend uh, no Canadian knows about, but he, he, he uh, he was first special service force SOE. He commanded SOE Paris. Um, he brilliant, brilliant soldier by any stretch of the imagination. So, like I said earlier, Navy SEALs get Hollywood to build them up. Us Canadians get the National Film Board, maybe. Huh. So, what I wanted to do was take all those elements and, and defend those jujitsu, judo, box, Western boxing, all the stuff we've talked about, and condense down to a tactical purpose. And it's brilliant. It's by far of all the military systems, and police systems I've, I've had a chance to train with or explore in 60 years, by far the best, most down to earth, gut wrenching system there is. And it's Canadian. But I can't let a fighter under Canadian student. I got more European students because they see it as brilliant. Mm. So, and this is a system that your grandfather used in court fought with in combat the, in, it goes the training dates all the way back to world war one the canadian soldiers the best trained soldier in the world, even today today best trained soldier in the world but we got to deal with ottawa so all those young kids that you train who go in the military in the old days would get a grounding in the system and it would make them an incredible soldier like i said to everyone i was teaching u.s army rangers a staff sergeant and rangers would make a good private in my regiment and I was a, a people CLI in Airborne and Sea Force, as you mentioned. So that guy, that staff sergeant who's a senior command level, would make a good private in my army. And our armed combat system, the Americans love. I taught the Green Berets. It, they, it's brilliant. But it was created, finalized in 1947, but it dates back to trench fighting in World War I. The guy who taught me bayonet fighting, George Klapsu, killed Germans at bayonet point at Vimy. Jesus. So when he taught bayonet fighting, you shut the fuck up and listen, because he stuck that motherfucker in a lot of Germans. Harold killed Japanese at knife point. So, you know, that's what we have within the system. So now we try to civilize it, take all that harshness shit out that we talked about earlier, and just try to keep it off the museum shelf, because it is Canadian. It is the only Canadian system, martial arts system, that's truly Canadian. But our ties go back. Canadian Army, who's all jujitsu there? Put your hand up. Okay. Canadian Army was the first Western Army to use jujitsu in World War I. They combined it with boxing, trench fighting. We were the first Army, Western Army, to use jujitsu. So, love that. Okay. Um, thanks for sharing that. That was awesome. And also, just that it has that lineage, you know, it's. It's something you dusted off of someone else's, and, and 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 I really appreciate that. We all appreciate lineage here on this show. Um, I don't know if you've seen this, but what we do is we go round the horn and talk about our time with you, and then the last word will go to you before we say goodbye and chat about our upcoming episodes. So we're just going to share our, a bit of our thoughts of our of our time that's flown by with you. So Hanchi Legacy, what do you want to say about our time with our guest tonight? Uh, I really liked it. I think the mustache is. That we were talking about before the show really means All right, something. Yeah, it's this part too, my friend. <laughs> yeah, so. um, I so much look at, I have students that are Ontario Provincial Police officers and the type of karate that we teach, they use. Leo Lokes, for instance, uh, Terry Potter. He's also an instructor, a uh, self-defense instructor or, um, and the hand combat instructor for the Ontario Provincial Police. And uh, it's nice to hear it from the street level side and not uh, what we were talking about before, about the persons who come in to take karate. And whether they're in the, kar the karate club or not, they don't really know how dangerous hand-to-hand -hand combat is. Or uh, they would never, they would probably be scared stiff and wouldn't be able to move if they knew, you know, uh, a police officer, what they have to do in just an ordinary day's work. Somebody could 
try to kill you. Somebody could try to run you down with a car. And even the worst thing is you have to shoot a young person because you have to save somebody else's life. That's that's a big demand. People don't realize that. They, they look at police officers as people who just give out tickets and you know stuff like that. Uh, I really appreciate the type of teaching that you do, but it's at a ground level. And uh, as far as a martial arts school, that's what I try to do, but um, only about 0.0001% of those persons ever last to come out that end, you know, to be hired in the fifth end and understand where martial art really is. So thank you for coming on to our show. We really appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Hanchi. Sensei Suino. Sensei Wolf, I enjoyed the whole evening, uh, but I had a particular sense of nostalgia when you were talking about uh, the military and the choice to either uh, go drinking or go to the dojo. Um, reminded me of, you know, I lived in Japan for four years, and one of the places I trained was the American uh, Embassy Judo Club, which was in the housing compound there. And uh, they security was provided by the Marines. And over four years, you could see whether the commanding officer was interested in having them do, you know, combatives or not, hand to hand or not. Because they show up at the dojo, or they wouldn't, depending on who was in charge at the time. And then uh, we'd go and train, and uh, uh, we were always very proud if we could get a few soldiers to vomit after a couple of hours of training. <laughs> uh, but the the highlight was that in the housing compound, we could go get beers for twenty five cents, and this was in Tokyo, where a beer cost like five bucks. So our routine was go train until you throw up, and then go drink on the cheap in the America's Embassy housing compound. <laughs> when can we go? <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks, Sensei Sweeto. Sensei Dauphin? Uh, Sensei Wolf, I absolutely love this. Um, I read a bunch of notes, and then I think about things for days and days after. Uh, I like at the beginning, and you just have a knack of just cutting to the chase of things, like getting past all the bullshit and just coming to the point of it, which I really love. Um, you started it off for me when you said, uh, people say all fights end on the ground and you said only if you're losing. <laughs> I, fucking, I love that. Um, uh, Thank you. When I train, I, I don't know when this happened, probably 15 or 20 years ago, I started training not, to face somebody like me, but to face somebody like you were talking about, at least in my mind, I started training somebody bigger, somebody faster, somebody stronger. And then I think if you train with that mentality, that helps. I want you to know that I'm now going to be incorporating somebody on painkillers, somebody who like, these are things that I think people should be thinking about if they're watching the show today and they're doing martial arts, they should not be thinking about fighting somebody at their level somebody higher, like you said, who will eat your arm off. Um, I like your conversations about the mind body connection that I'm really like attuned to that. Um, I also liked when we were talking about all the hard stuff, how you stepped back and said, but you have to build people up to that. They don't just walk in the door and you don't just like pick them up over your head and start slamming them onto the ground. There'll be nobody here then if we do it that way. Right. Um, <laughs> I like you talking about your dad being a drinker and a boxer, and that's why you did judo. I'm happy your dad was a drinker and a boxer, and that <laughs> that benefited all of us that that spurned you into the dojo. So um, I think we all relate to you when you said the dojo felt like home and it still feels like home. That's why I'm sitting in a dojo doing this. This is the most comfortable place for me to do it. I love being here. Um, Running away, your most effective move. Just looking forward to getting out of bed and training for the next five years. Um, that's an interesting answer that you want God to introduce you to the person who started all this so you could just cut through all the bullshit and, and get the answers right from who started it. Um, yeah, I want to, I'd love to talk to you more about assertive confidence at some point. Like that's a topic that um, I can tell you're really passionate about and I'd love to learn more about that from you. Um, 
again, I knew the answer inside of myself, but it was happy to hear it from you about fine motor skills that people are just fucking lazy <laughs> and they just don't train hard enough to actually do those fine motor skills under pressure. Um, you really remind me strongly of uh, Sensei Anthony Sandoval and Hunchy Montalvo. Sensei Sandoval is Sensei Legacy's teacher. He was a Marine, did a bunch of tours in Nam, and then was also uh, stationed in Okinawa and trained martial arts there for about 18 years. Um, and Hunchy Montalvo is a U.S. Uh, he's an ATF agent who's been in deep undercover many times. And the three of you just, it's hard to talk about yourself as a martial artist <laughs> and see th these types of people even be impressed slightly by having a street fight once and, and knocking somebody on their ass or something. Right. So um, again, I, I, not only do I want to thank you for coming on the show, but I also just want to thank you for the service that you've provided to the country and your community and now to the martial arts community. So um, we're all, we're all respecters of the military and police on this show. And so thank you for, uh, the work that you've done there. Thank you. And, you know, I, I get to say so much during the hosting of the show, Sensei, but the one thing I just want to really highlight that I just kept writing down is technician, technique, technical. And when you talked about Kimura, yeah, I know who Kimura is. And man, I just was like, wow, this is, this is one of the reasons we do this show. And it's right before you said it. You know, how nice would it be to have one of these recording video? But we don't. And that's why we have people like you on this show who stood in front of Kimura and did a seminar with him before he even knew who the man was. And then you get to take the fact that he said, go work this technique, young man. And now you're still thinking, OK, young man, train this technique. And that's how I feel right now. I feel like all I'm doing is going into that dojo and just trying to get a little better at the stuff I was taught by doing it a little better the way it's supposed to be done. So it was really lovely to have that reminded, but not just the technical aspect, but why we're doing this show and have people like yourselves on. So what do you want to say before we uh, do our housekeeping home, Sensei Wolf? Who's buying a beer? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, meet you in the, I'll meet you in the pub in 10 minutes. Uh, okay. Well, I think what you guys are doing is, is brilliant. And, you know, if, you know, you know, we all have our road to go and you just keep, keep trucking along one foot in front of the other. And, you know, you know, you've all got a diverse background and then that's, that's the encouragement I tell people, you know, just don't stay in one lane, learn. You know, as in the military, we, you know, we did a, in the seventies, we had to learn the Russians because Sistema was the scary everything. So we studied Sistema and went, no, it's not so scary after all. So you learn what the enemy knows to make it your own and stuff like that. You know, you hear all this shit before, but for all of us today, the street's not even what it was like when I was a kid. I mean, I had, fights in the park uh switch blades and all kinds of nonsense when i was a kid because it was up in hunter park was Maine and hastings uh, in vancouver right now it's just drug central um but what's out in the street today like the little community that i live in now the violence level is insane and you know it's just not the scripted drugs we're talking about we're talking about drugs that are created that make people almost invincible so you know when you that's that's another level of training that not a, so much training, but a mindset that I will survive. I'll never give up in that confrontation, which I'm sure you all are doing, you know, the mind body connection and how it addresses violence under the stress load of combat and all this stuff is, is something that we have to really rebuild back into what we do. But in modern terms, you know, I, I did a seminar a while ago and the guy kept telling sa samurai stories. And I said to him, you tell one more fucking samurai story, I'm going to stick my pen up your ass. You know, <laughs> it made no sense in, in that context. So, you know, but the training you guys do, just, you know, keep plugging away at it. Um, you know, for me, it's been a 60 year journey and I, you know, I'll keep going as long as I'm able. And, and I got my kids to train. My, my wife is, it's going to keep beating the shit out of me forever. So, and stuff like that. I mean, I tell the young kids to come out and train me. I'm in my wheelchair. I'll still come here and beat you. So, stuff like that. It's that attitude that we all do. I mean, if we could all go back and knew who the people we train with and knew exactly what we could gain from them, it would be brilliant. And there's so many men who've passed, like you said, that we should have paid more attention to. Like, years and years ago, when I trained with the Gracies back in California, I was attached to the Marine Corps. They were doing one of their... Um, 
uh, garage dojo things. And I got taken there by these force recon Marines. And said, oh, we have to learn these guys from Brazil. It's called whatever jujitsu secret shit. So I went there and they were doing ground fighting. And I went, oh, it's fucking judo. And, you know, I did a, what they call a Kimura. And they said, well, how do you know Kimura? And I said, it's not Kimura, it's Yoshigami. Like, no, it's Kimura. I'm like, okay, whatever. So they never invited me back, let's put it that way. But, you know, it's like, you know, there's the story of training is what you know to be true. And you know, like the rap, you know, like I said, the rap in the guard punches the balls up. But it's also true of how edged weapons are delivered today and all these things. We have to get outside that box. And we have to really start looking at how things are done. And what I would encourage is, you know, the tradition is brutal important, but also figure out how to incorporate that reality-based side of, for lack of a better description, into, you know, the attack. You know, uh, if you especially you know, if you have like a one day a week special self-defense thing, make it street applicable, and because you're doing a service to your students, and if you are training police officers, and as you said, make sure, you know make sure they know it because. You know, a cop just can't be half good today. They've got to be real good. You know, you know the old joke is you can't have a, a pilot who flies a, a commercial airline who's half good at flying. Because what we're seeing in the States now, and this is the emails I get all the time from DEA and different police firms, is what's wrong with the training. And you can't half train police officers. You can't half train soldiers. And nor can we as martial arts half train ourselves. And it's leadership by example. And you guys... Are leading and I encourage you to keep doing that and you, you can't get someone to do something you won't do like my wife keeps complaining because my gut gets bigger than my my belt line she says well you can't tell people off for being out of shape if you're a fat fuck so stuff like that so you've got to you know you've got it you got to keep it going you got to keep doing it. I mean I still try to do high roundhouse kicks and um, you know spend the next day swearing at my wife because my back's all buggered up but I'll do it I mean so you know but you got the right idea and I love the questions and I love how you guys approach it. So I encourage you to keep it, keep going. And if I can answer any questions for you, you know, you got my number now, Robert's got it and you guys got it. I may actually pick up the phone because usually the wife does because I'm not good at that shit, but it's just training guys. And we all know that. And there's like you said, too many people are afraid to train and you have today, you have to step it up. It's, it's, you know, I, I heard a scary thing the other day that they're going to take wrestling out of the Olympics and put gaming in because gaming has a $2.4 billion audience. 2.4 billion people watch or do gaming. So here's the original wrestling. You want to take that out of the Olympics and put gaming in. So are we next? So we have to find a better way of making ourselves applicable, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And I'm sure you guys are all thinking about that. There's no easy answer. I mean, if, you got, if you're a marketing guru, you can probably do it. But the soft sell, the easy way is not the best way. And people have to learn that, but it's a stepping process. I have guys in Hungary train, and they were doing break falls on concrete, and there's perfectly good to tell them. They said, what the hell are you doing break falls on concrete for? He says, well, I'm toughing the guys up. He says, no, you're tenderizing them. You're not toughing anybody up by doing stupid shit. Because you can't fix stupid. And mm -hmm. it's the hard thing. You have to get through a thick skull. So you can't fix stupid. So like I said, I'm going to have my beer. So I hope you guys will join me in all that stuff. And uh, like I say, I appreciate the time to pontificate with you as much as I have. And I, I enjoyed meeting all of you one day in person, I hope. I look forward to that, Sensei. Uh, I'm just going to say some quick thanks before I throw it to Sensei Dolphin, who's going to tell us about our upcoming weeks. I want to thank Mike Russell, Andre Sedeshev, Justin Shea. Daniel Holland III, Robert Shlumsky, Jesse Belay-Vitao, and Alden Adair. They run the behind-the-scenes jam that you're all watching us platform on top of. We're so grateful to them for running this show. Sensei Dofa. Yeah, Sensei Wolf. Uh, Sensei Legacy and I are going to be out in BC in the summer, so maybe we'll we'll connect with you and see if we can, uh, can hook up at some point. So that would be great. Um, what's coming up is next week we don't have a show on the 16th because Sensei Suino will be traveling here. Uh, since the Benson's going off to LA to be an actor like he does, but Who's we're the gonna... actor? Sean Benson is the actor. Yeah. So we're going to drop one of our shorts, which is with Sensei Ooh. Copeland about funny things that have happened in the dojo over the years. Um, then after that, on the 23rd, we have uh, Sensei Ron Fagan 
And then after that, on March 30th, we have Sensei Gary Hales. And uh, really looking forward to talking to both of them as well. So Sweet, Sensei. Great, great time coming up. And remember to tune in on those shorts when we drop. And we might not be here in real time, but we love keeping the show ticking along. So you have that consistency out there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Senseis. I never take for granted the honor that it is to be chatting with you on Thursday nights. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks as well. Thanks, everybody.